Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's EAB University webinar. My name is Jessica Simons. I work with the Southeast Michigan Resource Conservation and Development Council. We are a small nonprofit group um, centered out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, that focuses mostly on conservation projects that also have an economic development component. And as you'll hear about over the course of the rest of this webinar, that kind of focus is perfect for what we're going to be talking about today which is utilization of ash in the wake of EAB. One more quick thing, uh, just kind of regarding logistics. I, if you haven't noticed yet, there is the little chat function over on the left-hand side of your screen. Please feel free to, um, to add any questions or comments that you have as we go, and we'll, we'll try to address those as best we can. So just to get started, I want to give you a little overview about where we were in Michigan. Uh, the emerald ash borer showed up in Michigan, what was first discovered in 2002, um, and we, we've really been battling the bug here for quite a while now. Uh, Michigan has really taken the brunt of the situation. I, I don't know how many of you in attendance here today have actually seen the devastation from the outbreak, but devastation is a good word for it. Basically, as far as Southeast Michigan goes, which is, is the most populous part of the state, that's where the Detroit me metropolitan area is and where um, most of the large cities are, where we have about half of the state's population, um, that's where Emerald Ash Borer hit first. And so we're really talking about, uh, about widespread, widespread insect infestation throughout many woodlots, but also throughout cities. So we have street trees in every community, just just uh, being decimated by this bug and it really was something that was pretty shocking for communities uh, as you know any of you who are there with communities know community budgets are tight right now and communities were really struggling finding a way to handle this problem so early on when emerald ash borer was first discovered the infestation was already quite widespread so we had a lot of communities that were just reeling from finding out that a huge proportion of their city trees were all dead or dying and that the timeline was pretty short for figuring out how to remove those before they became major hazards and so altogether in michigan i think the best estimates now are that we have 25 million dead ash trees and as you, i'm sure you can all guess that 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 brings off a lot of other questions. Where is all of that wood going to go? How are all of those trees going to come out before their hazards? How much is that going to cost? How are they going to be replaced? And so the picture that you see here is from a park in Farmington Hills. You can see many dead ash trees on the ground and all of the trees standing in the, ma the main portion of that photo are all dead ash trees that were waiting to come down. And, I, and that was a pretty familiar kind of picture that you would see in many communities around the state that that in many cases whole streets were just paved with nothing but ash along those streets and uh, that not only is an expensive burden and one that's difficult from a logistical standpoint but it's also one that's really devastating for people who've come to depend on their streets being tree lined or their parks being filled with trees all of a sudden they're not anymore and so it's really a, a terrible problem that you know full of a very distressing messages one after another and we really were looking at this trying to think you know isn't there any positive situation here is there something good that can come of the emerald ash borer outbreak so together my organization together with the u.s forest service and the michigan department of natural resources started back in 2004 on creating the ash utilization options project and so as a part of that what we basically wanted to do was figure out how much wood was coming out from the ash removals related to eab figure out what the quality of that is, what the quantity of that wood was, and to figure out how we could secure more of it, to identify products that could be made from that wood, and people who could process that wood in the private industry, and to figure out what markets are already available, and figure out what markets could still be developed. And in doing that, we used a lot of strategies. We did some research projects, did some demonstrations, did a lot of training programs with local stakeholders and a tremendous amount of outreach and networking. And I'll talk about all of those components as we go on. But the real, the real motivation for doing this ash utilization options project was that we saw opportunity. As I said, this has been a devastating problem that, that so many people are faced with very tough problems, very expensive problems facing emerald ash borer. But in all of that, we can see one bit of, of hope for communities to find some value 
in what was completely a, pro a, a waste disposal problem. And so what we wanted, we were challenging people to do is to look at this wood and to not look at it as waste. Instead, to try to find the value in it. We wanted to demonstrate safe use, that yes, there are quarantines, yes, there are very necessary restrictions, but within those restrictions, there still is a lot of potential for being able to safely recover material, to be able to move that to industry, to be able to turn that into products without magnifying the problems with spreading the insect in any way. And in doing this, we also wanted to use this as um, kind of an experimental opportunity. How could we take this emerald ash borer problem and use it to create, um, use it as a catalyst to create better urban wood recovery as a whole. We have all of these communities involved. We have all these communities that are facing a problem. And we know that this is, <laughs> this is the bad part of the message. This isn't likely the last challenge like this that they're going to face. We saw this happen with Dutch elm disease. Now we're seeing it happen with EAB. Another generation from now, there's surely going to be another major forest health problem facing our communities, and we need to be better prepared next time. And so if we can create a better disaster response, we can, we can find better ways to recover material and to be doing this on an ongoing basis, having the partnerships in place, having the infrastructure in place so that we can capture wood, turn it into value, and next time we have a flood of trees all coming out for some, um, some major forest health problem or even for ongoing um, urban wood issues like um, storm damage, um, like uh, development that's happening. We can better capture this wood and um, turn it into a resource that our, our communities can benefit from. And in doing that, we also wanted to find ways to reduce the disposal costs. When you're looking at the expense of removing trees, the expense of replacing trees, Disposal doesn't need to be another expense. And so if we can find ways to effectively partner with local businesses, we can also find ways to, again, look at that as a value that can just be moved into industry rather than something that we're paying to dispose of. Yeah. That's OK. Sorry about that. There seemed to be a little audio loss. Um, I'll back up just a little bit. Um, but we, we wanted to reduce the disposal costs for our communities. And in doing that, we also, and especially in these times of economic crisis that we're all facing um, in a recession, we, we also can use this as a way to strengthen local wood industries in the process and to create some real economic development in our communities and a positive outcome from the whole situation. So one of the first things that we did in Michigan um, in 2005, we worked with some, some researchers to do a wood residue inventory. We wanted to find out just how much wood was available from the emerald ash borer outbreak, but also how much wood is available in all of Southeast Michigan from the urban area. And so we looked at both the trees that come out from the urban forests, um, all of the trees that are dead and dying, that are standing on our streets. We also wanted to look at the amount of wood that was generated by the manufacturing sector. And so kind of the whole big picture of how much wood is available. And what we found was that of the 2,600 companies that we surveyed in Southeast Michigan, they were creating seven and a half million cubic yards of wood that was considered waste a year at a cost of almost $9 million to dispose of all of this. So that's a huge amount of wood that's available. Not all of that is ash, but ash definitely added to that flood. And so we realized that if we look at the ash problem in perspective of all of the other wood that we're generating, we have a huge opportunity here. But so many of you might be asking, you know, you may have heard, well, wood coming out of communities isn't of any quality. It all has contaminants in it. It all um, it, you know, has metal in it. No mills want it. Nobody, nobody can use this. We found that that's not true. We literally had researchers from the Michigan State University Department of Forestry going out doing timber evaluations in the, the streets of Southeast Michigan cities. So we have timber crews out there evaluating wood in Detroit, <laughs> um, which you know unusual sight to see. But what they ended up finding was that the dead trees alone that are standing in Michigan's, in Southeast Michigan's communities could produce almost 5 million board feet of lumber each year. That's after we actually accounted for wood that's accessible, so wood that wouldn't have to be pieced out into, in, in small sections to get past fencing or to get um, out of backyards. This is, these are whole logs that could be extracted and that are of timber quality. After accounting for all of that, you know, we find that we have enough wood to build 362 average size homes a year out of the urban forest. 
we also found that emerald ash borer boosted that that uh, dead tree figure by about 10%. So, you know, 10% more is an expensive problem, but we can see that it's Okay. Audio back on? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so I'll back up again. Um, not sure where that cut off last, but um, so we're finding that emerald ash borer only added about 10% to the ongoing wood residue problem that we have in our communities. And so Throughout this whole presentation, I'll go back and forth between talking about what we can specifically do with the ash resource from EAB, but also what we can do with the other huge quantity of urban wood that is available, that is of quality, that um, could be a better resource for our communities. Because again, I want to frame this in what we can do right now in response to EAB and what we need to set up so that we're protected for the future, so that we're not in this situation next time. So the first question that everyone's probably wondering, yes, we can talk about the uses for ash, but is any of that relevant? Um, can ash really be used safely in the framework of the greater emerald ash borer um, quarantine movement and what we can do to stop the spread of this bug? So what we found is that ash can be used safely. Emerald ash borer is just what's considered a cambium feeder. And so if you look at the photo of the log on the right there, you'll see all of the, those trails right, um, right on the, the outer portion of the log. So what the emerald ash borer does is it, it, it lays its eggs right underneath the bark. The, those eggs hatch and the larvae feed right under the bark, but they don't go any deeper. So they don't actually go into the most valuable portion of the wood. And what this means is that once you remove the bark and that first inch or so right underneath, the rest of the wood is free of infestation and it still retains all of the value that that log had to begin with. So what we've seen in Michigan and in many surrounding states, both the state quarantines and the federal quarantine program that is set up by um, USDA APHIS, they both are currently have the position that as long as you remove one inch under the bark, that wood is, is available to be moved um, and available to be used as different products. So as long as the wood is kiln dried, fumigated, or bark free, you have a lot of possibilities for the kinds of products that, um, that, that can be made from it. But as always, you should check your local quarantine restrictions before you get, have any ash, wood, uh, um, any ash wood program in process or before you start working with industries. You want to make sure that um, there can be some restrictions on when logs can be transported and how, what the distance is for when logs can be transported. So um, you'll want to check with your local officials to make sure that you're completely following the local reg regulations. So what are the, the potential uses for ash trees? The short answer is that, well, you can use ash for anything that you can use any other hardwood for. Um, it's definitely very suitable for lumber, things like railroad ties. Um, firewood is still even a possibility. I know that firewood is definitely one of the most common ways that problems like the emerald ash borer are transported, but as long as you're using it locally. So for instance, if you have a backyard tree that um, needs to come down, it's made of ash, you have a fireplace, you can definitely use that within your own home. Um, the problem is when you actually transport that to another location, that's when you have the danger of transporting um, the beetle as well. Ash specifically is um, very valued for tool handles and things like baseball bats, um, for anything that needs to have a lot of strength, but also a little bit of flexibility. Ash is historically used uh, by the Native American community. Um, black ash in particular is used for a lot of basket making, and you'll see an example of those black ash bats uh, black ash baskets there in the center of your screen. Um, ash can be used for flooring, uh, fine art, you can see benches, uh, basically you can use it for a lot of different things. Um, one other major usage that we've seen here in, in Southeast Michigan is local biomass energy production. And so there there is a, um, a, a major utility scale wood biomass plant that is in Flint, Michigan that has absorbed a lot of the wood that has come out from the tree removals in Southeast Michigan. 
So um, I'll, I'll start with the bad news and finish with the good news. There are a lot of challenges to utilizing wood that comes out of an urban area. This is, um, this is definitely the case for ash that is coming out of communities, but it, it's going to be the case for um, other species that are coming out of communities as well. First off, that urban location can be, can be challenging in itself. That Basically speaking, the wood industry isn't used to working in cities, and so we don't really have a lot of infrastructure in place. Um, loggers don't go into cities, obviously. Um, just transporting logs around um, through city traffic can be really difficult. A lot of tree removal services don't have the capacity to move whole logs. And so those are some logistical challenges that you need to work through if you're looking at how to better utilize wood. Um, Overall, we've seen a slowdown in the wood industry, especially in recent years. The housing markets um, definitely have seen a downturn, which then trickles down to um, the primary and secondary wood processing industries. And so the market for timber isn't great right now. And ash in particular doesn't have a great market. And so those, um, those can be real challenges to deal with. The scale and supply issues of dealing with urban trees is also something that can be a little difficult. The fact that you have um, you know, in, in a traditional forestry operation, you, you go in, you go to the forest, all the trees are in one area, you're, you're taking all of these logs down into one staging area, it, it's, it's easy and it's um, efficient to go in and to pull all those logs out in one place. In a city, that's a lot more challenging. Um, also, the short timelines that are in place for tree removals in communities can also make things difficult. If, if the people listening here today, if you, you are just starting to develop your emerald ash borer plans. And if you have any hopes of utilizing those trees, you need to start thinking about utilization at the beginning. Because what ends up happening is that a community realizes they have emerald ash borer and the response has to be immediate. They look for a tree removal service that can come in, cut down the trees and get rid of the wood by following um, quarantine standards and to do it as quickly as possible. And when that happens, you don't have time to evaluate all of your other options as far as utilizing the wood. And so, um, the, the timeline can is maybe one of the biggest challenges. The more time you can give yourself to evaluate who your potential partners can be, to look at what different products can be, and to figure out how to set those up in advance, the better prepared you're going to be for when you actually have to respond to a new insect outbreak in your own community. Um, transportation and lack of support are both um, also major challenges. The lack of support one I think is maybe one of the biggest ones. The fact that traditional arborist companies don't generally and I, there are exceptions, but don't generally look for higher value utilization for the trees that they remove. And the fact that communities have been told for so long that street trees are of no value, the, those, those are real things working against you. And so you'll, you know, you'll hear from plenty of people that there aren't options, that nobody will take this wood, nobody can turn it into anything, and that's not the way we do things. And uh, that's, that's something you'll find commonly, but I, I think from the examples I'll show you as the presentation goes on, I, I don't think that those are, um, that's not the whole story. Now, there are some market realities. Um, first off, with any urban trees, what we've seen in our area from the efforts that we've put forth, that urban wood use is more of a niche strategy. It's not a commodity. So you're really not going to find a log buyer that's going to swoop in and say, oh, yes, we will give you thousands of dollars for all of these ash trees that you have that are coming out. Um, you're going to have to be more creative. You're going to have to think about um, creative uses. You're going to have to think about how you can use it in your own community or how small, small shops can use it. It's not typically a kind of situation where a big buyer is just going to come in and take care of the whole, the whole issue for you. You see the most value when you can add value through the story. And so I'll, I'll give some examples of this later, but this story really resonates with people. People like to hear how we can, how we can um, reclaim the value in what, how we can recycle these trees and let them live on. These are, these are trees that have been very meaningful for people. When you're talking about the trees that have lined um, citizen streets and the, the, the trees that have been in people's backyards. They want to know that these trees can continue to have a life and that there can be some value here. Um, there, there's a lot of sentimental attachment and this is a way that you can gain s public support for urban forestry initiatives and to show them that you're being a responsible steward of the resources that you have. And one way of doing this is creating local markets. Finding, try to keep this wood local instead of looking for a big buyer that is um, 
you know, somewhere off um, in, you know, an, an alternate market. Instead, look at how you can use this wood in your own community and really take advantage of the growing green, um, you know, the, the growing green sentiment al um, among most of the community that there are a lot of people that are really looking for more sustainable options. There are people that are interested in green building despite the local economic conditions. And um, this is a way to take advantage of that and to be able to supply a local resource that really meets that interest. So a uh, quick reality check again, to kind of backtrack a few of the things that I've said. Um, communities can successfully reduce their wood disposal costs by finding wood use options, and they can save on wood product costs for city projects. If you already need lumber within your community, it doesn't make sense to pay someone to take your wood away and then buy lumber from somewhere else. But having said that, communities are rarely successful in profiting from their municipal trees. So as I said, you're not typically going to be very lucky in finding a buyer that's going to come in and write a big check for all of those logs. But you can really see a, a reduction in your expenses. So some of the benefits, as I mentioned, they're lower wood disposal costs, affordable and possibly free wood products. And I'll give some examples of this as we go on. You can have some new and really interesting public-private partnerships, seeing ways that industries and communities can come together to um, benefit collectively from what most people thought of as waste. I think you can, can tell a great story with full circle urban forestry where, you know, so often when we think of urban forestry and we think of arboriculture, we think of this as tree planting, we think of this as tree care for trees that are still standing, we think of it as treatment sometimes, and we think of it as removing dead trees, but it stops right there. Here's a chance to look at those trees as having another step. They're recycled into products that the communities can still continue to benefit from. And then sometimes, in some situations, we can even take those products and use some of that to even help fund tree replanting so that it connects the whole circle. It really um, continues that idea of resource stewardship. And um, for any communities that are out there looking at their overall carbon footprint, milled wood products are a way to store carbon. And this is something that an, an idea that's really gaining a lot of momentum in the wood products industry and something that you can look into. But um, I can send more resources if anyone's interested in this particular issue. But um, you know, we're looking more and more about how dead trees, when turned into solid wood products, can continue to store carbon. And if you're looking at a big scale for a community, this could have an impact in a community's overall carbon plan. But most of all, it's a real positive story for the public. So if you are looking at what to do in your community, the very first steps by far is, is to inventory your capacity. What ash resources do you have? How many ash trees are going to come out? Do you already have emerald ash borer? What's your timeline like? What's the quality of those trees? Um, do, you, do you already know whether or not there's damage? Is there, um, are, is that, do you have full logs that are of good quality here? Do you have the capacity to process those? Are there partners locally? Are there mills that you can access? Um, do you have equipment that can help transport logs? Um, do you have the expertise? And that's a big thing. Do you have people that can identify quality in your standing trees? And do you have people who know what kind of products those could turn into? But the other question that I always like to ask communities in particular is what products would bring you the most benefit? So. I, I think the best value that communities can have is to address, address their own needs. And so setting up your wood plan is going to look different for every community. And it's going to, to differ depending on you know, what you have in terms of an ash resource and what you need. So there's no right answer. And I'm not saying that, um, that everyone needs to mill their trees in a certain way. That's definitely not the case. There's a whole variety of options available to you. And if you look at this, this little um, table, you can, you can see. Starting on the left, we have lower value products. There are things like firewood, mulch, compost, biomass fuel. Those are all legitimate products, and those are great ways to use wood. That's especially appropriate when you have a lot of wood that needs to be used. You have um, access to very little processing ability. Um, you maybe don't have mills nearby. You don't necessarily have people who have the expertise to process it into higher value that all can work. Then there are things that have a little bit higher value. There are products like railroad ties, landscape timbers, rough sawn lumber that's appropriate for, you know, all sorts of um, just kind of baseline, you know, construction use. Things like truck sideboards, trail borders in a community, barricades, um, things that don't have to be pretty. 
as you go over to the right hand side of this you'll see there are products of the highest value things like artistic pieces plain lumber finished products flooring paneling furniture these don't use as much there aren't going to be as many logs that are suitable for those kind of products um, you're definitely going to have a much more limited resource as far as that goes and they're going to require more specialized equipment and higher skilled processors but you're going to get a much higher value out of them I think the best plan is when you're always looking for the highest and best use so that you are actually using wood across this whole spectrum. You're using the highest value logs for the highest value kind of products and then realizing that you're going to have a lot of material that isn't suitable for those that you use on the lower end of the scale. So another thing that you're going to want to consider right away is how you're going to collect and sort wood. In Michigan, um, very early on, eight yards were opened up throughout the major metropolitan area to contain all of that affected wood. And it, it really had a couple of purposes. One was to bring all of that infested wood into one place. So homeowners could bring it in there, um, private companies could, other communities could. And that way we knew as much wood as possible was being collected into one place where it could be safely handled by people who were, um, who were actually certified to handle it. Most of that wood was used as biomass fuel, but those woods also, uh, those yards also gave it the capability for that material to be sorted and to be merchandised into other kinds of products. So in particular, if you're thinking of setting up a plan, there are some other strategies that you can use kind of community-wide for promoting more use and to seeing what the real opportunities are in your own area. Um, first and foremost, you're going to want to conduct outreach and training. So, you know, this message is really going toward the community planners, the, 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 gov the governments that are out there, state governments to um, local nonprofits, you know, any of you who might be listening. If you're conducting outreach and training, you're finding out, um, you know, who all is out there who's interested. You're making sure that they have the skills or they have access to the, the kind of education that they need to properly handle this material, to process it. And you're providing them with networking opportunities, helping interested communities connect with local sawmills, helping biomass energy firms connect with, um, with arborist companies. You know, there are a lot of these kind of networks that need to take place. And so if, if, um, if there are organizations that can help facilitate that, you can see a lot more higher value wood use happening in, in your communities. Another thing that can be really interesting is creating demonstration projects. If you have access to funding, it can be very helpful to just create some projects that can capture the community's interest, show them how this wood can be used, and get them excited about it. And what we've seen is we've, we've managed to fund some demonstration projects over the years. These have gotten great publicity. The media has really, really been excited about them and given them a lot of great coverage. The public has responded very favorably. As I said, Emerald Ash Borer brings a lot of very negative messages. And this is one way that you can add a positive um, a positive message to that that overall picture and let people know that something good can come of this and then finally supporting new research um, we've done a lot of work especially um, with Michigan State University's Department of Forestry on looking at what um, different markets can be for ash different treatment possibilities can be for ash how we can better collect and um, collect that material into yards and make it more efficient and so by continuing to support new research we can keep looking at these ideas and expanding them and finding better new answers so I, I've mentioned some of those demonstration projects. Um, we, and, and some of these were very small. Um, we, we've been very fortunate to have funding from the US Forest Service um, through the Wood Education Resource Center over the last few years. But you know, some of these have been big. We've given out $50,000 grants to help small businesses purchase sawmill equipment, all the way down to $1,000 mini grants that helped communities do very small scale wood use projects. And all of those things really went a long way to showing people what the potential is. So we had everything from local conservation districts, salvaging logs from um, community tree removals, working with local mills, milling those into lumber, and then selling the lumber back in the community as conservation district fundraisers. That, that was a great example. Um, it, you know, it captured wood on a, on a small scale from local communities, but it also helped provide some income for the conservation district. We saw things like the bridge that you see, um, the bridge that you see down in the, the lower left-hand corner. Um, that's at the Detroit International Wildlife Refuge. They were building a new stream crossing there. And um, instead of just putting in a bridge, now that bridge has ash railings and has signage letting the community know for all of the visitors that go to this wildlife refuge what the impact of the ash resource has been in the area, why they might be seeing dead trees throughout 
the, the, the um, forests and um, showing that this wood can be used. But then we've had everything all the way uh, to the kind of opposite end of the scale. You know, those are more rustic projects, but we've also had fine art exhibits where local woodworkers have come together. And for a couple of years, we had wood exhibits, um, woodworking exhibits throughout the state of Michigan that showcased what local woodworkers and artists could do with this salvaged wood resource. So now I want to get um, more specific into, uh, into some successful community examples. Um, the city of Monroe, I think, has been one of the ones that has done a really fantastic job with how they're handling the wood that's coming out of their communities. They really look at it as that highest and best use kind of scenario that I described. And so what they simply do is, as trees are being removed in their community, they stack logs in the city's municipal yard. When the, lo when the log pile gets to be too big and starts to get in everyone's way, they call a local saw portable sawmill service that brings the mill right to the city's yard. So you can see the mill set up there on the left. Um, in, also in the meantime, something else that the city's been doing is they continually go around to different city departments and they ask them, what do you need wood for? Um, are you building? Are you building park benches? Do you um, do you need wood for truck sideboards? Does the parks department uh, need some some trail uh, some um, trail backing? You know all of those kind of things. And they also write down the dimensions of what they need. So by the time they call the sawmill service, they have a whole cut list prepared. So they know exactly what wood they need and how much they need of it. The mill comes. They spend a few days at the city site milling all of the logs that are available. And what ends up happening is that they always have far more lumber than the city can actually use. And so the city takes about a quarter of the lumber that's produced. That wood is all cut right to their specifications for what they need for city projects. And the mill owner takes all of the rest of the wood back as payment. No money exchanges hands. The city gets rid of all of those logs at no cost. And they have lumber that is sized right for their projects that they did not have to pay for. And this mill owner walks away happy because he has a large supply of lumber that he can then sell at a profit. It's a win-win for everyone and really a great example. Now, Monroe also generates a lot of other wood that isn't millable. And so they have extensive firewood programs for their local citizens. They also have an education program that goes along with that that makes, um, makes every one of the citizens that takes firewood aware that they cannot move it out of the city um, due to the emerald ash borer restrictions. They have mulch and compost programs. Um, and so they really are looking at how they can get the best value out of all of the wood that they produce. Gross Point Park, Michigan, really has done a lot of other amazing things with the wood that they produced. Um, the wood that you can, the flooring that you see in this picture is in one of their recreation buildings. This is an ash floor from ash trees that were dead on the city streets of Gross Point Park. And so they, um, they're fortunate to, they contract, all, uh, contract out all of their tree removal services and that tree removal operator also has a sawmill. And so he mills logs that um, came right off the city streets and make and turns those into products that they can use. Um, they've also made framing for different um, recreation fields that they have in the city. They've done um, benches uh, for city buildings out of ash. And so they've done a lot of really exciting and beautiful things with, with the ash trees in their community. The University of Michigan's, um, a couple of their land holdings have also had some nice examples. Um, <laughs> For any of you who might not be familiar with Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor is an interesting place. And so you have a lot of very, very passionate environmentalists in Ann Arbor. And so the, the university's Arboretum and Botanical Gardens both had some huge ash trees that all were affected by emerald ash borer and needed to be removed. These are high use recreation areas. And the trees that were along major trail systems were a real hazard. Um, you really can't have people hiking the trails when you're worrying about um, an enormous ash tree falling down. And so we actually helped conduct some um, tree removal training programs right on those properties. And by <laughs> we started off first thing in the morning one day, um, you know, doing some of these tree removals. By noon, the the manager of the properties was getting flooded with angry calls and emails from people who were furious that these ash trees were being removed. They wanted them to remain standing as wildlife habitat, which is a lovely thought, but really not one that um, makes sense from the university's liability insurance perspective. And so, um, you know, we were a little worried about how much heat he would take for you know having these dying trees removed. Well, what ended up happening is that the university also took that wood, had it milled, and turned it into flooring that was used to restore a historic barn 
um, on the botanical gardens properties. This made the local papers and you know there's a great article about it, a whole feature showing the, the property manager and how they decided to reclaim this wood. Next thing you know, they're being lauded as these great conservationists, this, this happy story. Everyone's thrilled that they're being such great stewards of this, of this wood. And so another example of how you can really take something that's a negative story, show people that, you're, that you're, you're really being conscientious about this material and that you're trying to be a good steward and um, having a great public response from it. Another thing that we've seen developed in Southeast Michigan is what we're calling the Urban Wood Project. And this has been a joint project between my organization and Recycle Ann Arbor and quite a few local businesses. Right now we have four local sawmills and a tree removal company that are all partners in this project. And they collectively are, are gathering wood from communities, um, from these tree removals, and turning it into flooring and lumber um, and other products and marketing it together. And so if you, you can visit the website for an online storefront, but they also have wood for sale at Recycle Ann Arbor. And um, it's been a nice way that we can actually show people um, that they can actually purchase this wood. Um, this, it's a sales opportunity for them. And, and what we've really tried to encourage the, these local partners to do is to, to capture the story. And so you can see here's a huge ash slab that would make a, a lovely tabletop that's all finished that a local woodworker um, has put together. But he also has the story. This ash tree was, was removed from a backyard on Franklin Street, you know, way to connect with, with the customer and to, to show them that this is, you know, this is the ultimate in purchasing locally. Um, our, we have partners in Illinois. The, there's the Illinois Wood Utilization Team um, that is also trying to work and to capture as much of the ash they can from the emerald ash borer removals in their state. And one of the high profile projects that they did was called Rising from Ashes. And they did a furniture show showing furniture from lost trees. And I'll just move quickly through some slides here to show you some of the pieces that, um, that ran in that show. They had some spectacular things. They partnered with the Chicago Furniture Design Association and, um, and had showings all across the state. And you can see these are all things made from ash ash trees killed by the emerald ash borer. So the next time someone tells you that ash trees from emerald ash borer aren't useful for anything, um, I think you can have a pretty good argument against them. Another good example of how ash can be used um, is in the Ann Arbor District Library's Traverwood branch. Um, we, we worked with the Traverwood branch to um, help them secure some funding um, that came through our organization from the U.S. Forest Service. And they were building a new um, green building uh, in Ann Arbor a couple of years ago. And they had the idea, the development site for this building happened to be filled with dead ash trees. And so they used the grant funding to harvest the ash trees, to have them processed, and turn them into flooring, beams, and paneling for the new library. And so, um, again, talk about a local project. The trees literally came from the site where the library was being built. And this, this captured the public imagination so much that a local filmmaker decided to document the whole process. And so a documentary called Up From Ashes also um, covers this story and, and tells it. It's, it's a great documentary. I highly recommend it. And if you go to the Ann Arbor District Library's website, you can actually view the whole documentary on there. Um, and I just realized I forgot to include the link in the presentation, but I can follow up with that uh, later on if, for anyone who's interested. But this documentary is getting so much interest. Um, it actually was chosen for the U.S. Green Building Council's Green Build Film Festival this past year. Only about a dozen films were shown at that film festival, which was in Arizona um, last fall, but this was one of them. So, you know, this is a story with national national impact. People are interested in seeing how they can make better use of their resources and this is a great way. And um, the library, I'll show a few more slides here. These are all from Architect Magazine. The library was also featured in the October issue of Architect Magazine and you can see some nice examples here. Um, this, this photo of the library, you, if you look closely through the windows, you'll see what looks like standing trees inside the building and they, they used the whole logs from those ash trees and actually use those as structural supports within the building. The, the other thing that's interesting is the way they, they harvest and prepared those, they left those emerald ash borer galleries intact and visible. And so that was included as a design feature. So not only does it make it more interesting to look at, but it also continues to tell the story so that as all of the people use the library for years to come and they're wondering about those trees, they can ask around and learn about the um, you know, the real natural history impact that this has had on, on our local area. But here's some more slides of that library. All of the paneling that you see there and all of the flooring is ash recovered from that, that development site. Here's another shot of the beams that run along the windowed wall. 
and a little bit more of the, the flooring and paneling. So from here on out in the presentation, I really want to talk about about planning ahead and what you know what specifically you can do and what resources are available for you as you're trying to decide what's appropriate for your own communities. There are three documents that I really recommend. Um, the <laughs> I included the links here. The, the print is a little small, so you might want to refer back to the presentation later on um, to get the full links, or we can we can pass those on uh, later if um, if you're interested. But there are three publications that I think will be very helpful. There is a Michigan State University Extension Bulletin called My Ash Tree is Dead, Now What Do I Do? Uh, that one is really geared toward homeowners. So if you have homeowners that are wondering, you know, I have one ash tree, I have five ash trees, what does this mean for my trees? Can I get use out of them? Am I allowed to use them um, on my own property? Do I have to dispose of them somewhere else? Can I give them to somebody? This answers a lot of those questions of how homeowners can find uses for their wood and how they can do it appropriately and safely under quarantine restrictions. The second two links that you'll see there are really guides that are developed for communities. And so the first one is a publication that we worked on with the US Forest Service, Cost-Effective Tree Removal and Utilization Strategies to Address Invasive Species in Attacks. And that really goes by some some point-by-point -point, um, examples of what some of the barriers are that you'll be likely to, um, the, some barriers that you'll be likely to to, to encounter and then what some of the opportunities are and how you can can prepare for those challenges and how you can really address them effectively. And so I think you'll find some great strategies in that document. The second guide is a community urban wood use utilization planning worksheet. And so this, it's really a questionnaire more than anything that goes step by step through guiding a community toward asking the right questions. You know, what does the community need? What examples are out there? What um, partners are in place? What are the um, what are the considerations you'd need to have before agreeing to some kind of partnership with industry? And so there are a lot of examples in there and a lot of guides toward helping you um, think your way through the process of setting up a plan. Another site I'd recommend is the one my organization has um, has established for the whole ash utilization options project. You'll see a lot of examples of the projects, the kinds of training programs that we've offered. Um, there are links to all of the research studies that we have sponsored, um, and then a, a, a very long list of resources that are available. And so um, a little bit more about the resources. If you visit that resources page, you'll find an exhaustive list there um, that have guides on emerald ash borer and how you can find more information about the EAB infestation as a whole and um, the research that's available on EAB. You'll also find guides that are not so geared toward ash, but um, that are they give, you, they give you more information on how to do a tree inventory, how to market um, timber, how to utilize trees, whether that's in an urban environment or whether that's in a woodlot. Um, that'll also, there are also guides on there for processors on, um, you know, properly um, sawing logs uh, for maximum value, on kiln drying wood. There are documents on woody biomass energy, um, on and, and then also other resources for, act for actually trying to help locate other partners. Um, another thing I should mention, all three of the guides that I had mentioned um, two slides back, those are all linked off of this one resources page as well. And so if you're going to just scribble down one link, this might be a good one to do. Okay. I know the audio cut out. Is that back on? Testing. Is audio there? Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, but as I, <clears throat> excuse me, as I um, mentioned a moment ago, if there's one link that you're going to write down, this is probably a good one. All of those, um, the documents that I referenced a couple of slides back are linked off of this one resources page. So that's a, a good place to go for a lot of information. Um, another one, if you just want to check out a little bit of inspiration, we do have a Flickr site put together that just has a lot of examples of um, of some different uh, different ways that people have used ashwood, and so you can see some nice photographs, particularly of some of the artistic pieces that were um, included in the Michigan art um, the Michigan art shows that took place a couple of years ago, and so you'll see a lot of nice examples of some ash um, ashwood as finished objects on this page. 
And then again, here's that Urban Wood website. And again, I'd encourage you to check it out, especially if you're looking at how you can help support the local wood industries that could be partners in processing it. You know, what we really found, there were a lot, there were surprisingly a lot of sawmills in the Detroit area and in this whole metropolitan region. But they really are flying under the radar. You know, these are generally small mom and pop operations, family owned companies, one man operations, and they don't have a really effective way to market the products that they produce. And so by creating this urban wood project, we were able to help them get a little more visibility in the community. And what we're really hoping is to help them set up long term partnerships with our communities so that the next crisis down the line, these people are already in place and communities know that they can depend on them. Um, another thing, if you want to really hear the story about how this wood is recovered and hear how it's used from local partners that are doing it, I'd encourage you to check out the Urban Wood Project's YouTube channel. And so you'll find seven different videos on there that have interviews with local mill owners, interviews with architects who've used the wood, interviews with furniture designers, and you'll just hear a lot of perspectives about why, why they think using this wood is important and why they think that this has a real market opportunity. The Michigan Wood Energy site is another one that might be helpful to you. Um, I, you know, I know I talked a lot about some of the highest value uses, but the reality is there's a lot of wood that is not suitable for milling. And wood energy is a real opportunity um, to, to capture a lot of that, that lower value wood and to, to make good use of it, particularly as more communities are looking for sustainable, renewable energy options. And so while the Michigan Wood Energy site was obviously tailored for our work in Michigan, um, there is a calculator on there that can be used by anyone. And that calculator actually is is a great tool for facility managers to go in and put in information. Um, it's really targeted toward um, institutional scale facilities, so a school, a hospital, a, um, a municipal building. And it allows you to go in and put information about the size of your existing boiler, um, the uh, amount of fuel that it uses, the cost for that fuel, and run a calculation to see how much converting to wood energy would cost and how much that would be over the long term, how quickly you could pay off the installation of a new system just through the savings you see in fuel costs. And so um, there are some other good reports and resources on that site as well. And it's, so it's, it's definitely another one I'd encourage you to check out. As I mentioned, our partners in Illinois, um, their Emerald Ash Borer Wood Utilization Team have also been pulling together a great number of resources. Their website is another really valuable one. Um, it has a lot of other great links and information, um, links to partners, lists of wood processors in Illinois, um, and uh, is another just really good site. Another um, great story from the Illinois team, one of the communities, um, Wilmette, which is just on the, the north side of Chicago, their um, their community president had several ash trees that came down right in his in, in his yard. He worked with a local bat maker to have those trees turned into bats that were distributed among the the city's little league teams. This this idea captured so much interest that it ended up on the Today Show, and um, it's a really heartwarming story. But I think another great example of how wood utilization connects people and it it really inspires people and it continues to get the emerald ash borer message out there. It lets people know that there's a risk, that there is, um, this is something that they need to be concerned about and that it really can have an impact on their communities. Um, finally, there's a new website called Urban Wood Exchange. This one is just developing. Um, this is also a U.S. Forest Service funded program. And um, this is another one that is going to be um, a place that can, can connect a lot of different companies and communities and um, help people find partners. And right now, I don't think their lists are, are very comprehensive, but it's one to keep an eye on that, um, that can be a good resource for you in the future. So overall, we're really seeing progress. We're seeing new entrepreneurs um, come in and develop businesses just to address urban wood, all inspired by the amount of resources that were available following EAB and all of those ash tree removals. And then we're seeing existing industries really develop to, um, to, to take on a, a new area by, because of this. And we're seeing more partnerships happen between municipalities and industry. And in a time when jobs are so scarce, any economic development is really an important thing. And overall, we're seeing greater public awareness. Um, people are responding and, and seeing that even if they live in an urban community, they still are surrounded by forest. People tend to be disconnected and they tend to think that just because they live in a city that forests are something that are away. Forests are something that are elsewhere and not relevant to them. But as soon as you can show them that the same trees that have lined their streets are still 
appropriate for wood products. They start to make those connect connections and realize that this really is a living forest that is around them that they need to be invested in. So um, my organization also just, um, you know, for anyone who's really interested in this stuff, we have some next steps in place. Um, we're working with some partners in Illinois and Wisconsin on a large scale marketing plan that will help create new market opportunities for the kind of wood that comes out of communities. We're also getting ready to start on a large scale um, demonstration of putting in putting together a wood use plan in a local community and conducting cost benefit analysis of that and environmental impact life cycle life cycle analyses of that. Also looking into some other alternative energy kind of things at um, the pellet fuel industry and more opportunities for wood boilers and to seeing how that and seeing how that can um, help address some of the urban wood that's available and um, looking at new research on how we can better debark firewood so that it's more appropriate for um, for use following um, outbreaks like emerald ash borer. And then finally, I definitely wanted to mention that uh, this work is primarily funded by the U.S. Forest Services. Wood Education and Resource Center, and that we're getting a lot of technical support from um, state agencies um, in Michigan, and then also in Wisconsin and Illinois. So thank you all for listening today. I hope I was able to provide you with some information, and I really, um, I really encourage you to look into your own communities to see how you can make best use of the wood that's being removed there. And I am definitely available for follow-up questions, should you have some. Thank you very much. Okay, we had a question, and the first one is, how do we dispel the myths about urban wood and their use? Um, I, first and foremost, I think one of the keys is taking advantage of demonstration projects, whether that's something that you can create in your own neighborhoods or whether you just refer people to the ones that have been done in other areas. And there are, there are great guides that have been put together um, by the U.S. Forest Service that, um, that and th those are also available on that resources page. And actually, let me, let me go back to that resources page just so you can get, um, so you can get that link again. But, you know, using examples, showing people that, yes, there are real challenges. Yes, there can be metal in trees. Um, yes, the growth form isn't always ideal. Um, in many cases, urban trees branch a lot lower than what you find in traditional woodlots. But the thing that we really found is that, particularly for high-end woodworking, trees that branch differently or trees that don't necessarily have the same qualities that um, traditional forestry operations are interested in can still be very useful and even desired for their high character um, by high-end woodworkers. And so, you know, a lot of it's just framing the message differently that this is a this is a different um, different industry and uh, there are different opportunities here, but they are legitimate opportunities nonetheless. Um, okay, so we had we had another question um, from early on in the presentation where someone was wondering about the 10% increase that I quoted um, regarding um, the impact that ash has on tree removals, and they asked if that was limited by funds. What what that really referred to was standing trees, and. So when we're looking at the mortality of the urban forest, that the mortality rate in standing trees in are in Southeast Michigan's urban forest, the mortality rate was boosted by about 10% due to the emerald ash borer. And so the removal rate is a very different thing and that varies greatly from community to community based on their funding and based on their, their own resources, um, whether or not they're contracting out removals or whether they're doing them internally. And so um, the actual removal rate can be a very different thing. I hope that answered that question. Okay, and our, our final question, um, we have the question about metal in urban trees, and I'm glad that this question was asked because I didn't give enough detail on this for sure, but that's absolutely number one, the first question we always get. 
why why can we use urban trees there's always metal in them whether that's from yard sale signs or from um, fencing that has grown into the the um, the log or you know there are a lot of reasons why you can end up with metal and other contaminants grown into logs but what we've ended up finding is that, um, again, we've been working with small scale processors. And so we definitely haven't had any case where um, large scale industry has come in and collected up a lot of these logs and managed to do it successfully over the long term. But by using a whole network of small bandsaw operators, um, that's where we've seen um, most of the, the milled usage anyway for, um, for these trees. And so by using portable bandsaws, there's opportunity there. So for any of you who aren't familiar with <laughs> the different types of sawmills, portable bandsaws are very different from that, um, you know, the large sawmill that you think of that, you know, featured in Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons and someone's tied to the tracks with a big circular saw coming at them. It's not quite that picture. Um, this is a small um, toe behind piece of equipment that can actually just be moved to a site that the the saw blade itself is actually quite inexpensive. Um, the different mill operators that I've worked with, a single blade costs them 25 bucks. They've told me time and time again that even though there is metal detecting technology that is available, and that's definitely appropriate for people, and you know if that's a concern, great, use metal detectors, scan the logs, and you don't have a problem. But um, for most bandsaw operators that I've talked with, the mill uh, the blades replacements are so affordable that it's really worth it for them to just mill as many logs as they can and take the risk of hitting metal. Um, if they wreck a blade, it costs them 25 bucks. It's not a big deal. Um, most of the time they're making far more, able to make much higher value product um, before they hit metal. And um, it's really worth it for them to, to go ahead. And so, um, you know, some, some people will work it in um, where they, they will work in the cost of saw blades into the job. And so, you know, for instance, if a community is contracting with a mill, maybe they're paying them by the hour and they also will reimburse them for any blades that have to be replaced. But again, they're 25 bucks a piece and um, chances are they're not going to hit too many.